Hi everyone and welcome to today's session um, organized by uh, the Alt Anti-Racism and Learning Technology SIG uh, Special Interest Group. Uh, my name is Matt, Matt Lingard, and I'm facilitating uh, today's session. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, please uh, free, feel free to use the chat at any time um, during the session. If you've not found the chat, then in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see um, three white arrows that opens the side panel, which is where you'll find chat and participants list and also settings, um, which you might want to look at if you're getting some annoying an audio, audio bings from your notifications, you can turn them off there. Um, it's great to have so many people here for today's session on uh, achieving inclusive education using AI. Um, I, um, I didn't say what context I'm here in actually. So I'm one of the organizers or facilitators of um, the special interest group. And I'm just here to do the introduction and get the ball rolling um, for today's session. So just let me say a couple of words first then about the special interest group um, before I pass over to Tunde for um, today's webinar topic. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was just share the principles of the special interest group. This is something that we do uh, ahead of um, any event or meeting that we host. Um, the group was formed in, in 2020. And one of the first things we did was come up with a set of principles. And, and that's primarily because of the nature of the special interest group and the topics that we touch on, uh, which can sometimes be both challenging uh, and personal. So we felt it was important to have a set of principles that we follow um, in meetings, particularly the, particularly the first one there. Um, number two is not relevant so much today. Um, it's just around confidentiality in our smaller meetings and when people do share more personal experiences. Um, but it's uh, really important to us that people follow these principles when attending our events um, and being active members of the SIG as well. Just say a little bit more about the, the special interest group for those of you um, who aren't familiar with either ALT, um, the Association for Learning Technology, or um, the special interest group itself. As, a, as I've just mentioned, the, the group was in, formed in a more informal manner back in 2020 and then formally became a SIG at the start of 2022. Um, and we've got uh, a much more detailed remit on the website which you can get to through that short URL or that um, QR code. Uh, but we're essentially a community of practice, um, bringing people together to talk around issues around anti-racism and learning technology. Uh, and we're advocate, advocates and really seek to progress things through, through our activities, um, which include events, but um, other, other uh, activities too. Uh, projects that various people in the SIG have been involved in. So it's really great to have you here today. If you're not already a member of the special interest group, being a member just means joining the, joining the mailing list. Um, and you can do that through the link on the page that's there. Um, it's great to see so many of you. As I say, feel free to use the chat. And it's now my pleasure um, to hand over um, to, to Tunde, who I know will want to introduce himself a little bit more. Um, and you will have seen his bio um, on the event uh, anyway, but Tunde is, I should say, is also the vice chair of the recently elected vice chair of the special interest group. So it's great to have him here to give a presentation as one of his first activities um, on the group. Um, and I won't take up any more of his time and I'll hand over to uh, Tunde. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Matt. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, making it to today's session. Um, as Matt mentioned, yes, I, I am the sort of current vice chair. But I suppose this event um, has been in the making for quite some time um, because we we started talking about it last year, if I if I remember correctly. Um, so it's a it's a real pleasure to to be here, and I want to thank the um, uh, uh, anti-racism and learning technology special interest uh, group for sort of inviting me um, to talk on this, I think, very important um, topic. Uh, one that I think has um, 
uh, not received the sort of attention it deserves, um, which is achieving inclusive education. And I suppose using the AI, because AI is a current buzzword at, at the moment within higher education, and, and it just makes sense to start to explore how we can use AI to enable that, you know, inclusive um, um, tendencies uh, that we we know that we can develop within our education. So I'm here to really talk about some of my uh, thoughts on this and also I've um, organized um, some events around um, um, achieving inclusivity within an, um, H um, E with um, AI and I've also organized some sort of roundtable discussions. One um, was organized uh, to two years ago at the Chartered um, Association of Business School um, Learning, Teaching and Student Experience Conference um, that was held in, in, in Belfast, I think. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about really are just reflections from those discussions and, and from those events. Um, before I go any further, I, I think it's very important to clarify how I perceive um, um, inclusivity or what I perceive to be inclusion. And the picture you see right now is my own definition of inclusion. And for me, it's recognizing um, a disadvantage and making adequate provisions to address that disadvantage, making sure that what we are measuring with regards to student is not what we call disadvantaged performance. So we want to be measuring the actual performance of, of students. So this picture is a very clear example of what it looks like. So that picture is um, a vertical jumping exercise. And before you jump, um, first they would measure your height and your reach. Um, and then you then proceed to jump. And then they then look at how high you've jumped. And that measurement is the actual um, jumping um, uh, performance that you've been able to sort of um, uh, convey. I think that in higher education at the moment, many of what we um, assess and how we measure student performance, for me, I think there's a lot of disadvantage within that, which needs to be accounted for. And I think AI will be a, a very powerful tool that we can use to eliminate those um, sort of disadvantages. So. Um, just to introduce myself uh, a little further, and I know you already have this information, I'm an inclusivity scholar, or that's how I like to describe myself. I'm also, in terms of my title, I'm also a senior lecturer in operations and quality management at um, uh, the Liverpool Business School. I'm also the program leader for the large collaborative program, well, the largest actually in the business school. And I'm also the associate dean for diversity and inclusion for the faculty of business and law at um, Liverpool John Moore University. A bit about myself growing up, you know, I grew up in Nigeria. Um, um, and of course, if you're familiar with Western Nigerian culture, um, usually deference is given to the father figure in, in the family. All right. So the, the, the elders have that sort of preferential treatment. Uh, and of course, in my house, it, it was no different, you know. So as a little boy, you know, uh, I, I would look at my father's plate because when you're looking up in, in the pot of soup, all right, there are two sizes of meat in there. There's a small size and there's a, a big size or what I consider to be, you know, large to my, you know, small mind at, at that point. So I always looked at my dad's plate and be like, oh my goodness, look at the size of that meat. You know what, when I grow up, I'm just going to have bigger size of meat on my plate. You, you, you just wait and see. All right. So that was my, that was my. So uh, a vision was formed at that point, you know. Um, but then, of course, fast forward um, several years, I moved to the UK. I got married. I got kids. Um, and you look in our curry pot. All right. Same size of meat. And I'm thinking, okay, so where is the preferential treatment? When, when do I get mine? Um, and, you know, sometimes I come back from work, you know, very tired. Of course, we've got just one snack left in the cupboard. And I think, you know what, I deserve it. I've been working all day and I go to grab that and I'm told, no, leave it for the kids. So the kids get preferential treatment. When I was little, my parents got preferential treatment. And it's just like, I can't win. I, I just can't win. Uh, 
And of course, true as it is in higher education, I think that also is sort of symbolic of how we perceive inclusivity. All right, so there are parallels to that story to um, inclusivity um, that we currently find in higher education. All right, so when you look at it, really, all right, I, the one always looking longingly at that big plate of uh, meat. I represent like the ethnically diverse you know, student groups. My father was always given the preferential treatment would rep, you know, represent the white student counterpart. And then of course the big plate of food or the big plate of meat uh, represents you know, that desirable you know, good grades, you know, um, two one and distinctions, you know, the de desirable good jobs, the desirable good pay. All right. So this basically, so, so there are parallels and, and this is a big challenge we currently face in higher education. And I'm sure that most of you are not, um, um, you're, you're, you're very aware of the awarding gap. Um, and, and that is an issue that many universities at, at the moment are trying to address. OK, there's also that sort of disparity in, in, in experience. For example, the National Student Survey um, um, in, in, in their report, they, they showed that, you know, the, the proportion of ethnically diverse students who didn't think that their um, assessment and, and, and the marking or the grades was fair was around you know 70% compared to the white counterpart. The awarding gap also is an issue that we currently face within higher education, where the proportion of ethnically diverse students um, getting to one and above is around you know 9% lower than the white counterpart. And when you start to sort of break that data down and you start to look at individual groups, you will find that it's even higher for black students. At the moment, it stands at 19% for black students. So th there is there is a, an issue uh, here that we need to that we need to address. Again, when you look at the number of um, and the portion of um, these groups going into uh, 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 full time employment, again you will find that there's also a disparity there where ethnically diverse student um, groups typically um, are 70% um, less than their um, white counterparts. So this is an issue that we are all well aware of. But then the question is, why aren't we talking a lot about them in the context of AI? Because at the moment, AI is being seen as a very powerful leveling up tool because it's sort of addressing some of our limitations as, as individuals. For example, in the um, in the medical world, it's being used to you know diagnose problems, you know uh, medical conditions. Um, in in the physics world, for example, in the physical sciences, it's being used to solve hard physics problems. In in the creative industry, also we're, we're also using that. You know, to very good effect in, in trying to sort of um, argument, you know, a creativity of um, of artists. But for some reason, one of these big challenges that we face in higher education, um, which is inclusivity, we, we're not seeing products that are dedicated towards, you know, you know, addressing that um, that issue. Of course, in higher education, we've got several applications at the moment. We've got chatbots, uh, we've got assessment grading systems, we've got adapt adaptive learning systems, and also in analytics. These are all the various um, places that we've been using AI. But of course, we still find that the experiences of students are not equal. Students are still reporting um, and disparity, all right, in, in how they experience higher education or whether it's in, you know, the general student experience or lived experience or whether it's with regards to an awarding gap or the assessment performance, there are still disparities and these issues, of course, they need to be, uh, they need to be addressed. And of course, here's my provocation, all right? Here's my provocation. And I think one of the reasons why we're still having this same issue is that many of the learning technologies that we currently have, and also many of the AI systems that we currently have, the intrinsic design, okay, lends itself naturally to the benefit of certain groups, all right? Uh, and while it's sort of disadvantaging others. And, and, and the real reason is because when we design, we mostly design for the majority, okay? Uh, so every time we consider, for example, inclusion, it's usually an afterthought. 
after a technology has been designed to cater to a particular challenge and then we then use inclusion or inclusivity as an add-on to say yeah it does this but then yeah it can also achieve inclusion you know if you think about it you know properly or if you handle it correctly so inclusion really has not been the primary reason for for design of course, that's not to say that, you know, at, at the moment, the DEI industry, you know, uh, technology industry is worth around 100 million um, um, and pounds. And of course, there are technologies in place, you know, for you know, addressing specific DEI issues. But when we come to higher education, we still far find that we're still lagging behind in the adoption of such technologies. And, and that is a problem that we need to we need to address. So what you find is that, you know, uh, like I said, it's usually the thoughts and a very good example would be and um, the ai systems that we currently have we all know that there's a wide application in assessment design okay for example but the question then is you know um, ai of course will always replicate whatever bias that is found within the ai um, the, the training sets that is used to train it so the question is what are we doing at the moment to ensure that we eliminate racial bias all right, because most of the time, what um, uh, designers do is they use those training set, maybe you know, um, um, scripts that have been marked, and they feed that into the AI system, which then sort of um, sort of learns. Okay, machine learning learns and then replicates the same sort of behavior. So the question is, how do we sort of um, address that? Because the training set is one very clear example where you know you know um, we need to start you know start looking at. So if I was to sort of um, then talk about what our potential solution is, so we've established that there is a problem. Inclusivity is a huge challenge. All right. We need to think about it more, you know, more closely. Um, so how do we go about addressing this problem? So first thing I think we need to do is we need to understand our context. Now, at LGMU, um, we were worried that, you know, the attainment gap or the awarding gap was very, very high. Um, and therefore we thought, okay, we, we needed to sort of address this issue. So myself and two other colleagues led um, an LGMU-wide project uh, on bridging the attainment gap. And so we did a, a number of surveys and we also did a, a number of interviews, even with staff members. And it was very, very clear that there were disparity uh, disparities in experiences, all right? Uh, in terms of, you know, how students felt with regards to assessment, the feedback that they received. And also, we also did some statistical analysis of the uh, performance of, of our students with regards to the different types of assessments, for, uh, for instance. So we, we looked at exam type assessment, we looked at report type of assessment, uh, we looked at um, oral presentation types of assessment, and different other types of assessment. We looked at nine different types of assessments. And we, again, very quickly found that, that our context, in, in LGMU context, for example, exam was one assessment type where both student groups, ethnically diverse students and also white students, performed the list. But when you start to then break that down, when we broke that down, we then found that there was a huge disparity between the performance of white students with regards to exam compared to um, uh, ethnically diverse student. So that level, that level of um, you know um, uh, uh, inquiry into our data is required. So we need to understand that context. I explain what that uh, means very quickly. And then, of course, we need to be able to um, we need to be able to respond. So in terms of understanding your context, we need to be able to con uh, collect and analyze our data. What is our demographic data? What does it look like? What does it look like in terms of gender split? What does it look like in terms of ethnicity, in terms of disability, religion, sexual orientation, you know, area of deprivation as well, all right? And of course, the very important intersectionality, all right? So what do we look like? What, what is our makeup as, as a body, all right? Because the, uh, the era or the idea of, you know, I treat everybody equally or I don't see color, I mean, that, that, we all know that that's, that's, I think, an irresponsible way of thinking, all right, if I may be and very bold. So it's important for us to start to look at issues, understand where those you know, disadvantages are coming from, and then we need to actively work at addressing those um, disadvantages. 
also performance data, all right? How are our students performing, all right? Student experience data is also very important. Of course, we don't wait until the national student survey um, 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 to understand what, what our students are going through. But then when you look at most universities, all right, the only time that we collect information from our students is at the end of the module, so module evaluation, all right? So we need to think a bit more about how we collect that information and how we utilize um, you know, those information. So that's very, very um, important. Moving on to the next um, bit, which is how do we respond? Now, there are two areas that I can sort of think of. One is the operational response or the operational uh, considerations. And then the other one is the design response or the design consideration. So when we, when we, when we think about operational considerations, so things, around you know, how do we decolonize the curriculum or how do we decolonize the pedagogy? In other words, how do we ensure, all right, there isn't any disadvantage in what we teach and how we teach them? And that's very, very important. And of course, there are currently um, AI systems that can help us to bridge that gap. For example, ChatGPT is one of the most um, popular one. But of course, there are other AI technologies out there that we can start to introduce into the classroom. The second one, of course, is regards to the awarding gap, because you know um, I, I believe that this also has a direct implication to uh, you know, finding good jobs because we know that many employers all, of course, always look for good grades, not necessarily the subject of study, but whether, you know, um, because good um, honors degree is always an indication that, you know, the students might be, you know, intellectually capable to do do the job. So if the awarding gap is always going to be there, then one can expect that there will always be a disparity in the number or the proportion of ethnically diverse students finding paid employment. So that's very, very important for us to, to address. Also in terms of engaging with students, and one of the things we found during that in, inquiry at LGMU was that students tend not to go to the tutors for you know, any que questions that they have what we found was that of all the five areas that the student can potentially go to for information, their peers is where they go to mostly, all right? Surprisingly, followed by their family members. So we have this idea within HE whereby we build this system, we, we, we provide support services, and then we find that students tend not to use those support services. And you start to ask yourself why. Now, I mean, for some people, then it's a case of, uh, but you know, I've put it up, there's, there's only so much I can do. But we need to do better in terms of, you know, understanding why are students not coming to us? All right. And then instead of asking students to come to us, is there a way we can take all this information to the students? All right. And I think chatbots is a very good way of doing that. Now, it's not a silver bullet solution to the problem, but it's something that we need to try and we need to be strategic about how we use how we use that. And I'll give you a very good example. During the induction is, you know, we've got a lot of students coming into into the university, all right? What we typically find, especially for international students, is they are, they are always late in coming. But what we then do during the indu induction is that we provide all that information to the students, but we don't make much provision for those late students in coming, all right? And I think that the chatbot would be a very good interactive way of getting that information to, to, to students. So those are um, potential solutions. Now, I've just put some examples in here, um, and I know some of you are already doing it, uh, but for those who are not already doing it, then it might be something that is worth you know, um, um, talking about. So for example, you can use AI in the area of pedagogy. For example, you could be using the flipped classroom. And this is also very good because you allow the students to sort of um, understand the topic, you know, research, do some research on the topic, and then you come into the class and then discuss. So you can use it in that sort of setting whereby you provide topics to the students, ask them to generate content using ChatGPT, for example, okay, before coming to class. So what you then do is you then ask them to take that content from ChatGPT and then 
then compare it to established textbooks or, or leading textbooks on that particular topic and then you see where where maybe differences are again it's just looking at different looking at things from different um, lenses also you can also use it in a, in a sort of in, inquiry based um, setting where you know you provide students with a problem scenario and then you ask them to produce say maybe three different solutions to that problem okay using um, AI so these are some of the ways that you know we can potentially start to sort of close that sort of disadvantage gap because AI is hopefully available to most people, all right? Um, also, in terms of curriculum development, some people have even proposed that, you know, you can actually use ChatGPT as part of the, the, the reading test or the, the, I mean, the reading list, okay? So, for example, you can ask, ask students to maybe produce different reading lists from different countries, for example, Argentina, all right? But of course, care needs to be taken to ensure that, you know, and they're able to access those texts, right, um, using the available university resources. Okay. Of course, we can also ask, you know, ChatGPT to generate multiple perspectives on a topic. And I've tried this, you know, several times. For example, I say, um, uh, you, know, you know, explain inventory management um, in public procurement, for example. And then I can say, okay, um, can you look at it from the marketing perspective? And you can start to see, you know, different angles or different lenses at looking at the same issue or the same topic. And that again will enrich um, the student's understanding of, of that subject. So these are some of these very simple ways um, that I, I think that we can, um, we can help our students. Again, in terms of responding, we talked about the operational considerations. We also need to talk about the design considerations. So we need to focus on how we design these technologies, okay, or how we sort of um, deliver these technologies. So, for example, we need to think about those that are designing these technologies. What is the diversity there? Okay, how well are you know um, how well is that group representative? of the community that they are serving, all right? So, and that's very, very important to have that sort of diversity of, um, of, of, of thoughts. Also ensuring that the training set that we're using, it's not just populated by the experiences of, for example, maybe white students or white staff members. And I know some people have used the acronym WEIRD, um, which is Western Educated, Industrialized, um, what was it? Uh, Western educated, in, industrialized, um, uh, are the democratized, rich, democratized. Okay, so we need to ensure how we um, get a balance, right, in, in in the training set that we're using. And of course, when we're designing stuff, we also need to limit what I call the overt, uh, overt or otherness in our design. And this is what it looks like. Okay, so I've just used this as, as a, 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 an illustrative um, piece. So, for example, if you think of the escalator, we always say, okay, anyone who's on a wheelchair, you cannot go on the escalator. You have to go. You have to use the lift, all right? And when we start to separate things like that, they say, you go there, you go there, we start to create that sense of, you know, dissociation, so, so to speak, from the, from the very community that we're trying to build, all right? And thankfully, I think in, in Japan, I saw this technology whereby, you know, people using um, uh, wheelchair can actually go on an escalator because they've sort of designed the escalator to allow people on a wheelchair to, to use it, all right? So in that case, you know, I, I see that as inclusive in, in, in that sort of sense. So whatever it is we're designing, all right, um, we need to ensure that we are limiting that sort of overt um, otherness, and, and that's imperative. I'm nearly there. Question now is why do we need to bother? Why do we need to you know, do all of this and ensure that we're, we're, we're um, providing an inclusive environment, okay, for our students. I believe that specifically as this group, because this is, you know, a select number of um, people. So as a, a special interest group, I, I think it's our responsibility to champion, all right, uh, the creation of AI and, and digital technologies um, that, you know, is designed specifically to address some of these inclusivity challenges that we're facing, because they are there, they are challenges, and we need to start to um, think about that. Normally, I would play I would play this um, 
video of uh, Chimamanda Adichie. Uh, she's a, a very well-known um, Nigerian author, um, and she talked about you know the danger of a single story, um, and and that effectively saying that you know as individuals we cannot just rely on our own lenses. We have to consider the lenses of of others, and I think that's very fitting for what we need in our education. All right, so as designers of technologies, we need to have that multiple lenses and not just use our own lenses because inclusivity cannot be an afterthought. Okay, it must be part of the grand design. Okay, it must be part of that uh, grand design. So we need to adopt that multi lens um, approach. Finally, all right. These are some of the um, practical ways that we can develop that multiple lenses. One is engage with the equality, diversity, um, and inclusion and belonging strategy within your organization, within your institutions. Also, get involved with the various staff networks that you've got um, in there. All right. Um, also, if you can, if there's a program, try and get yourself on that reciprocal mentoring. OK, um, and I think that would also help build the empathy that I think that we all we all need. And of course, there are a lot of research that has been done in this area. So please, you know, get those um, research articles and, and read a bit more on them. And then finally, of course, um, there are existing toolkits. Um, many institutions have what what they call the anti-racism um, toolkit. And these are you know, some of the things that we can sort of start using. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I know, you know some of you might have questions um, or even comments, you know, things that you've experienced that, you know, that will be helpful for everyone to to know that is also welcome in, 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 in this setting. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your patience. And I think I'll hand over now to Matt. Matt, yes. Yes, uh, thanks, Sunday, And thank you very much um, for your talk this morning. Um, I encourage people to thank you in in, a, in the digital way, uh, which is never quite the same as a round of applause um, in, in in the room. Thank you. Um, but thank you very thank thank you very much. I'm just going to stop uh, sharing the slides so you, so you can see uh, Tunde and anybody else who puts their their camera on, um, and we'll move to uh, questions now. I've got three lined up in the chat. Um, if you would like to ask a question uh, using the mic um, and or video, then feel free to put your hand up as well. Uh, but I'll just go through the three in the chat. There's also some comments in the chat. So if you've not had a chance to look at those, I'd encourage you to do so too. And those who've made comments, if you want to um, voice them further, then feel free to uh, raise your hand as well. So the first question uh, we had came from um, from Lillian Joy, who's at the University of York, and she was asking, um, is there any data on what kinds of assessments are more equitable for disadvantaged students? So I'll start with you, Tunde, but obviously others can come in too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's why I said your um, your context is very, very important. Now, when we did this data, it was because we couldn't find any sort of data, you know, uh, anywhere on the on the performance of students with regards to specific. Um, assessment times but then we quickly realized that hang on a minute we have this data all right and um, so we thought okay we will do a statistical analysis look at the historical performance okay based on the assessment times and we're also very careful to also understand also the differences in um you know uh, sort of an instant assessment for example exams or a sort of deferred assessment, for example, where you ask students to maybe write a report and you give the assessment brief to them well in advance. So we also looked at the um, also issues around you know group assessments and also individual um, assessments. And we also asked the students, how do you feel? So we asked them about the level of anxiety um, that they had towards group assessment and also individual assessment. And there were very clear differences between you know the perception of all the various student groups and also you will find and i think this is something that has been going on right now in, in even in our education a conversation that's been going on and that conversation is around how we disaggregate those data 
all right? So it's not enough to just say ethnically diverse, all right, and group them all, all right? So we have different groups within that. We have several groups within that, and all also have different perceptions, um, and, and that also needs to be taken into, into consideration. So, so I would say that, you know, your institution is the first place I think you need to go for that sort of data, all right? And I think there's a need for us to also start to aggregate those sort of data across universities. But I suppose that's a, a project that can be undertaken going forward. But I don't know if anybody else has got information on that. Thank you. Thanks, Sunday. Um, yeah, please, please feel free to uh, raise your hand uh, if you if you want to come back on any of the questions um, as well. Although I'm directing them to Tunday, we very much encourage answers from from anybody, from everybody. I'm going to move on to a question now from uh, Mike, and, and actually Mike's put a few comments in, in the chat during during this as well. So I don't know, Mike, if you want to hop on the mic, feel free to do so. Uh, but Mike's initial question Tunday was. Um, if ChatGPT has been trained on biased data, um, how does it decolonize anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think what, what we need to think about is when we talk of decolonization, and I know it's a, it's, it's, it's a concept that, you know, is far reaching than just the mere the, the mayor sort of, you know, looking for textbook from different um, um, uh, countries or from, from different cultures. Um, but when we're looking at, you know, different texts in, in, in that sort of context, I, I think, so what I did once was I, I, I asked ChatGPT to give me um, one of the leading texts, for example, from Chile, all right? And what it did was it returned uh, an abstract of the book, of course, in, in uh, is it, I don't know what they speak in, in Chile, whether it's Spanish or the Chilean language. But then also gave me, uh, an, uh, uh, not interpretation, a translation of that abstract. And that helped me to then look at that text and say, okay, does it have the inf sort of information that I'm looking for? So my next step then was to say, okay, where can I find this um, um, textbook, all right? hopefully freely, or if you've got um, library resources, then hopefully it should be freely available in, in your library. I suppose that's where we are at the moment with um, chat um, GPT. And I did, because sometimes, you know, when you register, they give you um, a form and they say, are there any sort of topics you would like us to sort of look into? And this was one of the things that I mentioned in the decolonization, you know, this is something that, you know, we really need to sort of think through um, and, and you're right, yes, at the moment we don't have the right solution, but there are little things that we can do using chat GPT in the spirit of um, decolonization of the text. Right. Thank, thank, that's okay. Uh, thanks, Sunday. Max, you've got your hand up. Did you want to jump on the, the mic if you're able to? Yeah, it's, um, thanks, Tunde. It's, I think there's a misunderstanding uh, you know, often by how ChatGPT works, um, it doesn't give you sections of anything. It's generative AI. It's using uh, statistical learning to uh, present stuff from lots of information. I don't think, you know, with the present version, I'm sure with future versions, you might be able to do it. You can't say, give me an abstract of this book. It won't do it. It'll generate and it will hallucinate, uh, just like it does if you ask it for references. Um, so I think it is very dangerous, in, and because it's biased, um, it's more likely to, <laughs> to give you biased uh, uh, information. You're, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think we cannot at the moment get away from the bias and we know that yes you're, you're you're right it sort of pulls information from the huge database and the question then is you know how do we even trust that database you know we, i mean social media for example is filled with so much untruths for example and we've seen instances of where you know people put in questions in chat gpt but then it returns something else um, and people are even clever now whereby you know they can fool chat gpt to respond in a certain way so it's not a like i said it's not a silver bullet solution okay but 
to give you an example, I was just very quickly trying to get onto ChatGPT and with, uh, withdraw uh, my history, my history um, because what I did was I asked it for a text for a particular country. And it did give me the textbook, and, and that, that textbook is verified. And I, I did ask it for an abstract, actually. I just said, find me a, one of the leading texts in this particular topic from this country. And it, and it gave me a textbook. It, it included the abstract and also included the translation of that abstract. And I did my investigation, and it did turn out. But you are right. I think we still need to be absolutely careful um, when we're doing this to verify things ourselves. Because like I said, I don't think ChatGPT can help us address that decolonization in the truest sense at the moment. But in terms of looking for text from different countries, um, I think we can use it for with caution, is what I would say. Thanks, thanks, Sunday. Um, what just maybe as an aside, but one of the other things that's been occurring to me is, um, for, for obvious reasons, a lot of the conversation um, has been around chat GPT specifically um, at this stage, but um, there are obviously a lot of other AI tools out there doing more specific things. Um, um, so, for example, I was looking at one called Elicit recently, which uh, summarizes research papers for you. So it's, it's trained on a much different data set. So I think um, it's going to definitely going to be an interesting area as these tools progress as well. Okay, let me, sorry, let me shut up and carry on with the question. So the next question came in from uh, Kerith, um, and it, it's phrased as a question that I suspect it's, it's more of a comment really, but I will read it out. So comparing sources and using ChatGPT, to inform understanding suggests that everyone will have equal access to technology. But is that the case? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, that, that, that's um, another challenge. I'm looking at chat GPT, for, uh, for example, um, from the perspective that it is a tool that everyone can use, you know, it's a conversational AI, you know, technology. So you can have a conversation with it and you can steer that conversa conversation to where you, you want it to go. Yes, we, we've got disparity in terms of access to digital technologies, of course, when you look at it from that sort of ethical um, point of view. And I'll give you another example. Um, when COVID hit, you know, um, it was then that we realized that many of our international students, for example, didn't have access, they didn't have access to laptops. So many of them were doing the assessment on their phones. Um, and that was a huge um, 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 problem um, at, at the university. And it also happened at a time where, yes, they normally provide laptops for students, you know, that you know they can use and then return. But all those laptops were used up very quickly. All right. So, so we had this group of students who didn't have access to all the digital sec the technologies that um, that we have, and I suppose that that is a, that is a, a valid and a big problem that we need to address. How do we ensure that students have access to to this to this technology? But I'm also looking at it from this perspective, whereby if I was in the class and I just said, you know, go on ChatGPT, for example, many of them having a phone, they, they can you know access it in that way. Um, so, yeah, I concur. Yes, it's still a big issue in terms of the um, digital divide. Um, but I, I think at the moment, using AI as a conversational piece to get information, although flawed at the moment, and that is an area that we need to look into or continue to look into, at least there's still some sort of access in, 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 in that way. Thank you. Thanks, to, thanks, to Nate. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to uh, comment on that particular topic, but um, I'll move on now. Rob's just put his hand up and I was just coming to Rob's questions um, in the chat. So I'll hand over to you, Rob. I don't know if you're going to comment, but you can also ask your questions from the chat. Okay. Hi, Rob. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I thought I'd give you a bit of a break, actually. And uh, yeah, good to see you, good to see you so, Tunde. You're so kind. Good to you're see so you, kind. Rob. Thank That's you. right. Yeah, Tunde and I presented actually back in in February, yeah. actually, on AI. Yeah. And it's amazing, actually, in the, in the months that followed that, how quickly things have actually moved on. Um, yeah. You've obviously done a lot of work on the attainment gap at, at 
your institution. Um, do you feel that you've actually made a lot of progress now, essentially? So have you seen that gap dropping as a result of all of this work that you've actually done? So essentially, for those of us that have still got this gap very much at the moment, um, you know, obviously we can look at, at chatbots and that, that's great. And obviously we, we've had that discussion about training data and stuff as well. Um, have, have you made the impact that you, you wanted essentially, or is it still, you're on a long road and we're somewhere, <laughs> we're some, or at least on the road now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for us, um, so this project was just, uh, was around two to three, it started three years ago, but it concluded about um, two, two uh, one and a half years ago, it concluded. So we're still in very early stages. So where we are at the moment is we've identified some of the gaps, problem areas, uh, where at the moment just introduce you know different solutions to it. All right. So the, there are different things going on in different um, parts of the university. One of them is this sort of mentorship um, and program that we're rolling out across all, all faculties um, uh, for um, you know um, peer entering of you know. Um, students maybe in um, their final year or maybe in their second year mentoring you know um, level one uh, I mean level three uh, level four students uh, first year students so that is currently being rolled out so at, at the moment we've not we've not implemented the solution and we we've, we've not done it long enough to be able to say that okay it's having this impact so I think maybe we need to at our institution at least we need to give it maybe one year more at least before we start to see if there's any sort of shift in the in the dial but at the moment uh, no I, no is what I would say yeah so the is the key message really is to get on the road start doing things because it's going to take a few years to actually start having some some impact really exactly 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 and, and then you discussed about assignments as well are, are there particular yeah. assignments that you feel are you know are, are ones that we maybe should start avoiding you know in the future are, you know because obviously you've broken it down by different assignment types by different um you know ethnic groups and so on so are there some that are really bad you know based yes. on what you've seen yes A exam is one of them exam is yeah. one of them um because like i said both student groups white and ethnically diverse um, both expressed a level of anxiety um, with regards to exams but when we started looked at when we looked at the performance data uh, it was very clear that for all the uh, so, sorry i can't show you the graph at the moment for all the um, different assessment types um you know the uh, the uh, the average performance uh, for uh, for the exam was around I hope I'm not uh, giving out um, you know, uh, LGM music right here, but was was very low compared to the others. And when you then look at the two different groups, you can you can also see that there's a, there was a huge disparity um, in there. So exam was one um, area that was uh, uh, that had the biggest gap is what I would say. Mm. Um, and of course, for obvious reasons, you, you, you can you can tell um, because, you know, in the exam, you, you don't know the questions beforehand. You're given a, a limited period of time. Um, and for, for example, non-native English speakers, you know, that's always also very challenging. You're tr trying to interpret what is being required of you. All right. Um, and then and then writing what you think the answers are. And, you always think in your in your language, don't you? Before you sort of sort of then translate it. But so, and of course, there were an, an anecdotal evidence to suggest that you know exam would be the problem. But through that inquiry or inquiry, we were able to confirm that this was actually the case uh, with regards to our students. So, so yeah, exam is one. I was doing a chat on AI yesterday to a, bit, a big subject group and because of the you know concerns I think are from the academics around AI they're saying do we need to move back to exams you know rather than some of these these changes because I think they're worried about students overusing some of the AI tools and how do they you know generate or how do we assess authentic you know student uh, you know grades and, and, and so on and there was this discussion do we need to move back to exams but based on what you've said that will also have its own problems and it's not a solution. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, remember, I think we had, we also had this conversation during um, the, the meeting we had in mm. February. And, and, and the reality is you just have to look at your historical performance data for your students. For us, it was very clear that exam was the biggest disparity 
um, inducer, <laughs> if I could use that word, um, within assessment performance. And I think the issue of chat GPT also, I think, is just laid to bear our over-reliance on written text. And I think that's that's one of the problems that we have, and we really need to start moving away from, from that. And I think there are two lenses that we can use here. The first lens is um, one that uh, people have been talking about, you know, how we sort of diversify assessment, right? And it's important for us to think about that. The second bit is, and the other lens that looks at, you know, what, what exactly are we measuring? So is it just, you know, re regurgitation of knowledge that we're interested in, or is it more sort of skill-based? Um, so, so there are different streams, you know, that are, you know, advocating for less use of exams. I'm not saying that we should completely take exam out of the picture. What I'm saying is that we cannot over rely on exam and exams. So the first question I would ask you or any person in academia is, when you look at the life of a student, the journey throughout the university, what is the percentage of exams that they've written? All right, uh, as, as, uh, what is the uh, proportion or the credits um, of the exams as a, uh, as a percentage of the total assessments that they, is it 50%, is it 50% of the assessment is um, exam? How much of this assessment is written, requires some, some form of written work, all right? And then we can then start to build a picture and then see whether are we relying on one kind of assessment um, compared to, to the others. And, and I think that's, that's absolutely necessary yeah, going forward. Thank you. Th th thanks, Tunde, and, and thanks, Rob. I'm going to... Got some feedback. Coming. Not sure where that's coming in from. Is that me? Oh, no, maybe it was you, Tunde. Yeah. No, I've lost you, Tunde, actually. Or have, or have I lost? Anyway. Um, AI is taking over the sound, Rob. I don't know who can hear me. Um, if somebody could just let you let me know if you can hear me. Um, but I, I'm just going to wrap up anyway. Uh, thanks, Nadia. Yeah. So many thanks to uh, Tunde um, for taking the time to present to us today. Many thanks to everybody for attending um, and for your contributions as well. Um, I've just put in the chat the link to both the alt website in terms of events and the SIG group. I uh, encourage you to join the mailing list for the SIG if you haven't already. Um, and the recording, if you came in late and want to watch the whole thing or revisit, will be available on Alt's YouTube channel at some point. Uh, but let's leave it there for now. Everybody can stretch their legs because I know everybody will be jumping to other things at 12 o'clock. Thank you very much. And once again, thanks, Sunday. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.